Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session of Bear Grabs. Professor Stephanie Wigand is the scholarly publishing librarian here at the University of Northern Colorado Libraries. She holds a Master of Arts in Library and Information Sciences from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Her current scholarship focuses on multi-institutional research collaborations, scholarly journal publication, and predatory journals. Her most recent work, co-authored with Professor Nicole Weber, and published in the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication is titled A Multidisciplinary Study of Faculty Knowledge and Attitudes Regarding Predatory Publishing. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you everybody for being here. I'm very pleased to be with you this evening. Um, I, I did want to give you my email address in case you wanted to contact me directly. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of caveats that come with anything um, that we're talking about legal wise, which copyright is all about laws. Um, so we'll talk about some of those caveats. Um, some of the things that you need to think about um, when you're talking about um, including someone else's work in your dissertation and thesis. Uh, we'll take a, a look at how you figure out whether you need permission or not because obviously this is titled, do I need permission to use this? Um, and then we'll look at some examples tonight. Um, please do feel free to ask questions at any time, but we'll go ahead and get started. So first caveat, I'm not a lawyer and this presentation does not constitute legal advice. So um, I'd love to tell you I was an expert in copyright. I'm not. You To be an expert in copyright, you basically become a lawyer and then you only do legal cases that are involved with copyright. Those are the true experts in copyright. The rest of us are learning as we go um, and able to give some kind of guidelines and rules out there to hopefully simplify things, but we are not legal experts. Also, copyright here um, means a couple of different things to any author. So there's the side of copyright that is for you, the dissertation or thesis author or scholarly project author who is writing something and wants to include somebody else's work within your own work. And that's what we're talking about tonight. But there's also the other side. Um, as you become an author and your work is out there, then you have rights to, to say who's going to use your work or not to an extent. So we can look at author rights in another presentation if that's something of interest to you. So you're welcome to put that in the chat. Um, but tonight we're just looking at the side of when you use somebody else's work within your dissertation thesis or scholarly project. So we're talking about intellectual property rights when we talk about work that falls under copyright law, but it is not the only type of intellectual property out there. So uh, registered trademarks, um, which also includes service marks and patents are more types of intellectual property rights. I just wanted to be really clear that I'm not covering anything about trademarks or patents tonight. We're just looking at works that are fall under copyright. Well, I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. We'll start with act ethically. I really think if you act ethically when you're looking at um, including somebody else's work within your dissertation thesis or scholarly project, you're gonna fall within the law. Um, it's, it's easy to say that if you follow these rules, nobody's ever gonna challenge you that you have violated copyright. That's just not true. Um, people can challenge you for using just about anything that's not your own work. The likelihood is what you need to look at. Um, and to do, to think about it in an ethical manner, to try and follow um, the rules or the parameters that are set out by the law, that's really gonna keep you in a good place. But we also recommend that you keep good records. So determine if what you're using um, falls under fair use exception to copyright law. We'll be talking about that. Um, if it doesn't, then you may be looking at obtaining permissions from the copyright holders. Um, and there's a chance that you can determine that, that neither exceptions or permissions are needed because they've already been granted or copyright on something no longer exists, or maybe it never existed. 
So think ahead as well. Um, don't wait until you're submitting your work to the graduate school as a final product. You want to be thinking about this as soon as you know you want to use somebody else's work within your dissertation thesis or scholarly project. Um, you need time to get those permissions if you can. No guarantee that if you need permissions, you can actually get permissions. Um, or if it'll fall under fair use, there's no guarantee there. You have to work that out. Um, so you want to start it at the point when you know you want to use somebody else's work. Um, and consider how you might want to use your work in the future. So maybe you're going to take your dissertation and publish a journal article or a book off of it. And, and you've created this a dissertation and maybe with some minimal editing, you can turn it into a book. But then you have to go back and think about anybody else's work that you've used. You've gone from a student work essentially to probably a commercial work, and that might change what rights you have to use something. Uh, so you might be able at the same time that you're asking somebody permission to use an image in your dissertation um, or graduate work, you might be able to ask them, I also plan to publish. Would you allow me to publish it in an article I'm writing? if you do need to get permissions to do so. Now, it may need to be done separately later. It's on a case-by-case -case basis that we will figure that out. Talking to your advisor is always a good thought, simply because they've been where you are now. So they may have needed to figure out how to get permissions to use somebody else's work within their own work. Um, they may have gone through saying, I want to use this figure or this table or this diagram. And then they figured out they didn't, weren't able to get the permissions for it. So what did they do instead? Um, talk to your advisor, talk to your committee. Um, they're going to be able to help you determine on a specific level how you might be able to get around not using something or how they went about getting permissions to use something. And of course, talk to a librarian. So uh, hopefully you'll find us super friendly here at the University Libraries. We are here to help you. Again, we're not lawyers, um, but we are here to assist you through this process. So just an example that I can give you from a few years ago, I was helping a nursing student who wanted to use a specific survey instrument within her dissertation. Um, she it wasn't available commercially, so she couldn't buy a copy of it or subscribe to a use of it for her dissertation. So she needed to actually get a hold of the copyright holder and, and ask for that permission. Well, the person that had written it, who was the copyright holder, was deceased. So she thought, okay, there's no chance there. I can't use this. And I said, well, let's take a look. And we figured out where she was. This person was an emeritus professor from. And I wrote to the um, nursing program in there and said, do you know who holds the rights to her works? Because she was kind of prolific. And they said the university did. And so uh, I think it was a nominal fee of like $40 to get a copy of all the materials. And then she could use what the in survey instrument she wanted to. Now, is that that necessarily true that all emeritus professors um, hand over the copyright to the institution where they are an emeritus professor? Absolutely not. It was just in this case. So it's, it's, it's kind of um, an adventure you're going on to figure out, is it copyrighted? Uh, who's the copyright holder? Can I get permission from it? Excuse me for it. The one thing you should do, or I would recommend that you do, always assume that it is copyrighted. If it is something that can be copyright, copyrighted, assume that it is copyrighted. So the copyright symbol doesn't need to appear on something for it to be legally copyrighted. Um, as long as it's fixed in a tangible format, so I could record it um, in audio, I could record it digitally, I could draw it by hand, I could write by hand. It's got to be in a tangible, tangible format, not just in your head. Once you put it down in that tangible format, it is automatically falls under copyright. So even if a website has no copyright symbol, even if the author doesn't give their name, 
that information that might be there or images or diagrams, you have to assume that they are copyrighted. So you're generally going to ask yourself all of these questions when you come across something that you might want to use in your dissertation. And there are lo lots of different things that you might use in a dissertation or graduate work. Um, from a, a musical score to maybe an image of a textbook page um, to a photograph of an arrowhead. Um, lots of things might come into play. Diagrams and figures from other people's works often come into play here. So first, is it under copyright? Did it ever fund, fall under copyright? Is it in the public domain? Is it licensed under Creative Commons? Or is it possible that it falls under the fair use exception? So let's explore those things a little further. Who holds copyright? Is it the author, the publisher, or some other entity? So as soon as I write something down um, that is not just a plain fact that is known the world around, um, I hold the copyright to it. But I may, in the process of getting it published so that it can be learned about across the world by researchers everywhere, I may sign my copyright over to a publisher. Or at some point, maybe it's been signed over to a publisher and then a single person buys out everything that that publisher has done, or maybe everything that that author has done. And then some other entity might hold the copyright to it. So just because one person created it or one organization created it, it may not be that organization or person or group of people that holds the copyright now. And sometimes um, it's going to be a different route to ask for permissions if it's an individual who holds the copyright and a much different experience if an organization owns that copyright. And copyright doesn't go away just because somebody has died. It doesn't go away just because an organization no longer exists. That copyright stays with it for quite a while. Um, so until it's a certain age, generally, the copyright is implied and it's, it's there. But there are a lot of things in the public domain, meaning anybody can use it without needing to ask permissions. Uh, so Generally, any work that, not generally, any work that was published um, or fixed under copyright before 1927 is now out from under copyright. So if you find um, this is a score, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the year that he wrote this. Um, it was not within the last century. Um, this is now in the public domain and I can now use it without needing to ask any kind of permission. Now this gets really complicated because if you think about it, um, the Mona Lisa is no longer in copyright. Um, it's long out from under copyright, but somebody else may take a picture of it. That, that picture now holds its own copyright. So just because the original item isn't under copyright anymore, the new tangible format that that work exists in is copyrighted. So that gets complicated really quickly. Government works, federal government works in the US, um, state, city, county, parish, are not copyrightable. The government can't copyright its works. Now, again, there's an exception. There's always an exception. Um, the exception here might be that the government contracts with another organization to write a report. Well, that organization may well hold the copyright now. The government wanted the work. The government paid for the work, but the other organization holds the copyright. So that's not always true. It's a case by case basis. Um, some things are now released directly into the public domain. Somebody says, I took this image, um, I painted this thing, I wrote this thing, and I just want it to be freely, freely available. And I put it up on the internet and I mark it with public domain and anybody can use it. So there are more things um, that may fall into the public domain. So 
um, copyright law, again, complicated, confusing, depending on who wrote it, when it was published, it may actually be in the public domain, even if it's um, been published since 1928, but you have to go on a case by case basis. And that's what we're here to help with. There's also something now called Creative Commons. So this is also for authors and creators who want to release their work into the public, but keep back certain rights. So the most common is CC BY, which is a legally binding um, license that says, I own the copyright for it, but I allow you to use it in any way you want to, as long as you give appropriate attribution. So if I created it, you're going to put my name on it and link to me and give information about the original author. Um, CC BY SA is um, you have to give attribution. You will always have to give attribution if it's Creative Commons um, and share alike, which means I can't say there can be no commercial use now. It has to be shared under the same license. The NC specifically stands for no commercial use. So somebody who's freely offering a textbook. So if I write an open, uh, excuse me, an open educational resource in the form of a textbook um, and I put no commercial, that means that no publisher can then sell that, that thing. Um, no derivatives means I can't change it all. So let's say you're doing it, you've created a set of icons, you put CC BY on it, somebody else can change that icon or they can recolor it or they can add it to something else. Um, if you have a no derivatives license on it, that means you're not allowed to change the color, you're not allowed to change anything about it. And then you can mix and match um, the S A N D N C BY and so on. Again, I'm going to keep saying this, it's complicated, but you're going to find journal articles that have been published um, under CC BY NC. And then you can you can go and say, I'm, I, that table is going to be really useful in illustrating my point, or maybe this figure or diagram will help me illustrate my point in my dissertation thesis or scholarly project, and you won't have to ask for any permissions whatsoever. And then we come to the fair exception, um, fair use exception for copyright. So sometimes um, what the law says is sometimes you can use things without asking permission, but the individual person who is using it, so the author of the dissertation, the thesis, or the scholarly project, that wants to use somebody else's work has to decide if they think it falls into fair use. Now, the librarians here at the UNC Libraries are happy to help you figure out kind of um, what in general ways towards fair use, what may weigh against fair use, but it is ultimately up to the individual author to determine whether they believe it is under fair use. We highly recommend that you take some time and put your thoughts down on paper so you've got a good record of it. So if anybody ever questions you, you can come back to that and say, this is my thinking, this is why I thought it was fair use. Um, and that can matter in a, in a court case. Now we do have a rather beautiful LibGuide that was created by a librarian here at um, the UNC Libraries that goes over copyright, but it also is really great at going over the fair use exceptions. Uh, so if you come down to fair use, it will go over the four factors of fair use and what you really need to be looking at. Um, so those factors are purpose, um, nature, of your use, the amount that you're using of the item and the effect on the market. So you may have heard someplace that, well, as long as I don't use more than 10 pages of something, then I'd be fine. Or if I just use this one thing on this one page, I'll be fine. It falls under fair use. It's not as simple as that. Um, so 
when we talk about um, the purpose of the use, what are you trying to do with it? So um, if we are trying to um, look at Young Sheldon, maybe an episode of Young Sheldon that we're going to analyze, um, the original purpose was for entertainment, but my purpose might be for uh, critiquing it or for analyzing the psychological issues in that nuclear family. Um, so I might be able to use a clip or two from it without ever having to ask for permission because I consider it fair use, because I don't think I'm going to affect it monetarily. I don't think the actual copyright holder is going to be impacted. Um, I'm not using the thing in its entirety and the nature and purpose of my use. Um, the, the nature of my use is for education and the purpose is not the original purpose of the use, which was entertainment and commercial aspects of it. So we're happy to help you go through that. And there is a downloadable worksheet to help you work for that, work through whether you think it's fair use. So you can use this document to kind of work through your fair use um, and how you come to the conclusion of whether you believe it is fair use or not. So when you use others' work in your dissertation thesis or scholarly project, um, when you've obtained permission or determined you didn't need permission, there's a few different things that you're going to include in the actual graduate work. So it's going to be listed likely in your tables or figures. Um, most, most things like that will be uh, listed in a, ta a listing of tables or figures. The actual image or reproduction of whatever you're using and the citation, and it needs to be a full citation. So um, in the examples, we'll see a lot of people forget the citation part and because that citation will help the reader go to the exact thing that you were seeing. Um, and then whatever permissions or rationale which I spelled incorrectly, which is lovely. Um, permissions or rationale that you've got, those will go in your appendices as well. This session is really not meant to scare you. Um, again, I think if you try to act ethically, you're gonna be just fine. But I've spent some time looking through, I think it was uh, 72 cases in Westlaw where I found the word dissertation um, and law lawsuit, or maybe it was just dissertation. And overwhelmingly, the majority of those cases was not someone suing a graduate student for having infringed on somebody else's copyright. By and large, those suits were graduate students or previ previously graduate students who had written a dissertation and then found out that their dissertation was used by somebody and it infringed on their rights as an author. So I don't think anybody's going through dissertations or theses or scholarly projects and looking for ways that they can file a lawsuit against you. I don't think that's going to happen. Can't guarantee it, not a lawyer, but it may hurt you in other ways if you don't properly go about this. So maybe you go into academia and you apply for a job and somebody looks at your dissertation and they say, well, why didn't you go through the correct procedures to do this? Um, I can remember somebody who was hired or was interviewing as a dean here at the university who there was some problems with his dissertation and for that reason, he didn't get hired. So those types of things can crop up later. I think that's more likely something that might happen if you don't do a good job in getting permissions or recording your reasoning um, and showing that you have the rights to include that in your dissertation thesis or scholarly work. But I, I, I really doubt that you're gonna get sued. Now, the way that may be changing is because of all the multimedia that can be included in your dissertation or other graduate work, meaning you could include an entire movie in there. Well, yeah, then it's possible that you would get sued over that. 
but that's generally not the type of uses we see in graduate works. So let's take an example, uh, look at some examples of things that have been included in dissertation. I think these are all examples from dissertations just because I have better access to those generally. Um, and that's where I was lurking. Now I tried to find an example of somebody doing it kind of perfectly, and I didn't find an example of that. I went through over 100 dissertations and didn't find somebody who had done it perfectly. Now, that's not to say that people aren't doing it right. Um, there are some people who are doing it very well, but maybe just not perfectly. And then there are a lot of people who don't use anybody else's works in their dissertation thesis or scholarly project. They only use tables and figures that they themselves have created, or maybe artwork that they themselves have created or composed. So people don't necessarily do this badly just because I couldn't find a perfect one. Um, and the intentions seem to be pretty good. So some examples. All right, so this first one is a figure um, that ended up coming out of a journal. Um, so the citation for the dissertation is on the right. Um, the publisher of this figure is the University of Minnesota because they own the journal MIS Quarterly. Um, the authors of the dissertation excuse me, of the figure are listed as well. Um, and there's no statement um, of permission or other notes in this dissertation anywhere that say they had permission to reproduce this figure. So they've done a good job. It was listed in their figures. They've reproduced the thing. And then they put um, a full citation there so you know exactly where it came from, but they didn't seek permission. Now, where this gets confusing, and I can't blame somebody for doing this, and I don't blame any graduate student or any author for getting caught up and confused by copyright and maybe not doing a perfect job, because I doubt I would do a perfect job. But where this may have been confusing for them is because they said, well, this isn't a journal article, and I'm not using the entire journal article. I'm just using a small portion of it, so therefore it's fair use. However, when we look at figures and images, they tend to be considered individually, even if they belong, are part of a greater journal article or a book, you tend to look at that as a standalone thing. So when you're looking at the amount of use, they are using the entire figure. So they really should be asking for permission for this. Now I went to, out to see, okay, what does it look like if I were to ask for permission from MIS Quarterly to use this in a dissertation. Um, the first thing they ask is, how are you planning on using it? They direct you, their website directs you um, directly to the Copyright Clearance Center, which is the CCC that you see up in the corner. And then the first thing that they do is ask you, how are you going to use it? And what type of person are you or entity are you that you want to use this thing? So from there, if you click the next button, you're going to be taken to a form that you need to fill out. They're not really all that straightforward. Um, I don't know if I still have this website up, but let's see. Yeah. Okay. So make it a little bit bigger. So I've answered that I want to put it in a publication because it includes books, journals, theses right here. And in this case, they mean theses to mean either um, any kind of graduate work, basically. Dissertation, master's, doesn't matter, any type of thesis. Um, am I a publishing company? No, uh, it's not the institution that's doing it. It's me as the author who wants to be able to use it. What type of use am I going to? Am I going to republish it in a book, journal, magazine, newspaper, newsletter? Okay, thesis, dissertation. So that's where I want to be. And then you get into some nitty gritty details. How much are you planning on using? What format are you planning on using it? Both or just one? Um, who's going to republish it? How long is the duration of the use going to be for? Now that's a hard one to answer, but life of the current 
work is probably what you would want to answer then. Um, lifetime unit quality. Now this is one even librarians aren't sure how to answer. So chances are they'll help you contact MIS quarterly. That's what I would do to see how they expect you to answer this. It comes with a little bit of an explanation, but not something that's necessarily really enables you to figure out how many, um, the lifetime unit, quant unit quantity there. And then it goes on. So down here, you'll see a price pending. So when you're asking for permis permissions from a, a journal or book publisher, there might be a cost associated with it. And at that point, you have to decide whether you're willing to incur that cost. So let's go back to the presentation. Let's take another look at another example. So here's a textbook review, Granite School District. So this is a document that helped them review textbooks. This was in a dissertation that was talking about textbooks and analysis of textbooks used in elementary, elementary schools, I believe. Um, so chances are, I wouldn't be surprised if this person had actually done their practicum for or student teaching within the Granite School District, and that may be where they picked up this document. Um, now, it's a, I don't want to say it's a rudimentary document, um, but somebody may have thought, well, this type of thing doesn't really fall under copyright. But again, it's in a tangible format, so we've got to consider it copyrighted. So it's an, this one's an evaluation scale that they may have actually used to evaluate textbooks in their analysis of textbooks within their dissertation. I don't know if it's published. They don't give us any information on where they found this. So was this just a print version that the school puts out? Did they find it online somewhere? they give no information on that whatsoever. So the author of this is the Granite School District. So there's no cred credit given to them in just a citation and there's no statement of permission. It's quite possible that depending on what they were looking at, they may have determined that this fell under fair use, a copyright exception but they have given us no information to go look at it for ourselves, to go find it and then and see how kind of maybe their thought process went. And they gave us no statement of why they think it falls under fair use. So my thought automatically goes to, well, they didn't do this well. They probably don't have rights to use this. They may, but their reader has no way of figuring that out. All right, so this is a conference paper, a reproduction of a conference paper used in appendix, uh, appendix of uh, the dissertation. So you'll notice by the dissertation citation and the author of the research paper that was presented at the conference, we've got the same person. So this person who wrote the dissertation also wrote this conference paper. So you would think automatically she, of course, has the right to use it. She's the author. She holds the copyright. But we've got to step back from that because the publisher is actually Springer. And unless she negotiated a contract with them that said she could keep the copyright to it, a lot of times we're going to assume that Springer now holds the copyright to it and she may not have had the rights to produce reproduce her own work because she was no longer the copyright holder. Again, I don't know that because she doesn't, there's no statement in here that says this is the copyright holder of this item. No permissions were needed. So without that uh, statement of permissions or a statement of why somebody thinks it's fair use, we have no idea what their thinking was in this. All right, so we see at UNC a lot of people who are using sheet music. So this is one that was done far better than I've seen 
Um, a lot of people do it with her letter of permission. So let's skip ahead to that part. We'll come back in just a second. So this is the query from 2007 uh, that the dissertation, the doctoral student sent out to the author or composer of the music saying, can I use all these snippets from your works? I'm not trying to reproduce all of the sheet music. There's, I don't want to have any impact on the um, commercial, any money you might make off of it, but I want to use some pieces while I analyze the music. And she got permission from the actual composer and said, yeah, you can use all of these. So why is this maybe a little bit confusing? Because we don't know where this came from. I don't know where the author of the dissertation found these snippets. Was it in a published work by a, a publisher who might hold the copy right now? Was it um, given directly to her by the composer? The, uh, and we're, we don't know that because they didn't give the citation within the note that goes under the reproduction. So we know that she had permission to use it. We don't know that she got the permission from the right people because we don't know where she got the actual items that she reproduced. But she did a really beautiful job of saying, okay, here's how I asked for permission. Here was the, the author, the composer's answer. But without the citation, we just don't know if she was asking the right people or not. All right, let's take another, um, we may have to, close off examples because they last a little while. But here's another one. Um, this was from a nursing dissertation. By the way, none of these dissertations are UNC students. And again, this is not to throw shade on any dissertation author whatsoever. Um, the fact that they don't necessarily include all the elements um, to make it really clear is the problem, not necessarily that they were in violation of copyright. It's just that we can't always tell if they don't give us all the information. So this was an instrument. This person did ask for permission, um, but again, I went out on the web and actually found this thing, but they don't give any type of citation here. So you don't know exactly what they were looking at. Did this come from a journal? Did it just come from an open website that the author put up? Was it in a book? We have no idea. Did, you, did she pick it up um, out of a hospital who was using it? But this is the permission information that she included in her dissertation in the appendix um, that she did not include her request, which makes it a little confusing then to read this really short answer from the copyright holder. Um, but she did go to the effort of requesting the permission, obtaining the permission, and including that in the appendices so anyone reading it can see that. I think we might actually be at the end. Yes, I think we're at the end of the examples. Uh, so I think I will stop sharing now um, and hopefully entertain any questions that you might have. Maybe we want to reproduce a large section of one of Hans Christian Andersen's um, short stories, or maybe the entirety of the short story. So that is no longer under copyright. It is now freely available to anyone. Um, but if Random House came along and did an anthology of short stories um, for children maybe, and included it, this specific short story that you want to use from Hans Christian Andersen. Um, the thing is how they typeset it, how they put together, how, what illustrations they include, that may all come through a new copyright of the work. So it may fall under a new copyright. So the one that you want to use is one that is no longer under copyright that may be available from the library of the internet 
archive or maybe from the Gutenberg project. Or maybe you find a paper copy that is old that is no longer under copyright and you can take it directly from there. Um, if you take the text out and not the image of it, and not any images that go with it, um, then you're gonna be fine using that copyright. Now, if it's available from various publishers at the same time, that's a more interesting question because you may be looking at kind of who's got the best deal for it. So if it's a, a monetary thing where they want you to pay 40 bucks, but I've got this publisher over here who's saying, no, we want 120, you might want to explore who has the copy, who holds the copyright to this, and what are they going to ask of you? Because we have seen commercial publishers who say, you know, if you're using this for a dissertation and you're only using this one image or this one figure or one diagram, you don't have to pay anything. We get it. You're a student. You're trying to create new knowledge. You are not making a lot of money generally as a doctoral student or a master's student. So we're not going to require you to pay anything. You fall under this exception to us making people pay. But if you were a faculty member doing the same thing, they would make you pay because you're out in the world making money. Not a lot of money, but some money. So it, it ultimately, again, falls under, it depends on um, what we need to look at. And it's an individual case by case thing. We need to find out if that publisher has a uh, exception for students or student works um, because they may not charge you at all there. Um, it may be something if you're willing to go through the process um, and say, kind of negotiate with the publisher. Say, I'm a doctoral student, I want to use these, but this is the amount I'm going to use each time. So it's not, it should not have any effect on your monetary, but I'm going through the, the correct way I think I should do this. Um, but ultimately, if you determine you believe your use falls under fair use, then you should go ahead and use it that way. You should either keep a dark archive, which means it's not included in the dissertation, but you've still got it. So if somebody comes and questions you on it, you should keep your rationale for why you think it's fair use. And um, you can also put a fair use statement why the rationale that you found under the four factors of fair use, the purpose, nature, amount, and effect on the market. Um, and said, really, there was no effect on the market here. Um, the amount I'm using is so small. I'm using it for educational purposes. I'm not using it to go play music somewhere where I'm going to make money. All of those things might weigh in favor of fair use. If you determine that to be to fair use, then you should use it as fair use. Um, I'd love to give you an absolute go do this as fair use. But the fact is, it has to be on you as the author of the dissertation, whether it's fair use. Um, and I'm, you know, legally, you might get a lawyer who has different insights. They could possibly apply for GSA funding. Uh, yes. But again, they would have to do it within the, the grant cycle. Yeah. Um, that is very possible. It's, it just goes to the argument for for planning ahead. Think about getting permission right away when you know there's something you want to use. And I will just reiterate that we are happy to help you kind of figure out what pathway you need to take in um, finding whether you can use a specific thing in your um, dissertation. Uh, textual works where you're actually including it as a paragraph block that actually falls under copyright too. And they say, if you use the heart of the work, then it's not fair use. So it could be a very small work, or it could be a very big work, but if you use that essential matter, it may not be a fair use of it. So you may have to end up going and asking permissions. There's a lot of little ins and outs with using copyright, but try and act ethically 
Um, make sure you give all the information in your dissertation. Um, I'm an advocate of putting your rationale for fair use in there um, if you don't need to ask for permission or putting in specifically in the citation or in the note for the figure or the table or the diagram or whatever it is, put in there under public domain or in the public domain, or it is a Creative Commons license um, by 4.0, whatever it might be, to just tell your readers, yeah, I did my due diligence, I, I figured this out, and I have the right to use it. 